Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of the 4040 Vision podcast, the ultimate sports history pod where hindsight is 4040. Before we get started, let's pay some bills and hear from our presenting sponsors. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 4040 Vision podcast. I am your host, Colette Abdallah, and I'm joined today by my fellow host, Sulman Huck. What's up, man? How's it going? Yo, what's up, dude? Not much, not much. So today's podcast is about the best and worst case scenario for the Western Conference teams in 2023-24. So the order that we're going to go is similar to the NFL one that you saw a few weeks back, and that is by projected win total. So we got these odds, I believe, from the DraftKings or FanDuel Sportsbook, one of those. So we know that these are a little bit fluid, but we're recording this on October 17th, so just about a week before the beginning of the season. And we're going to go in order, as I said, by projected win total. We'll talk about the best case scenario, the worst case scenario for each team, what we think is more likely. And of course, we'll also cover some key additions and key losses from these teams, as that is, of course, important for the context. So we'll start with the defending champions, the Denver Nuggets. Their projected win total is 53 and a half. And last year, Coincidentally enough, their record was 53 and 29. Some of their key additions including included Justin Holiday. They brought back Reggie Jackson. They brought back Colin Gillespie. Gillespie, sorry. And they drafted a couple guys in the late first round and early second round. And their big loss is Bruce Brown and also Jeff Green, I guess. So, Salman, what do you think are the best and worst case scenarios for the Denver Nuggets this year? Yeah, the best best case scenario, right? Denver just continues where they left off last season, right? They're just dominating. They 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 look like the championship uh, winners that they are, right? They're 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 contenders again this year. Nothing. Jokic is you know just dominating the league again. He's an MVP finalist. Bruce, losing Bruce Brown doesn't matter because they just replaced him with someone else. Um, so I think that's the best case. And worst case, obviously, right? There's some regression. There's some you know winning the ring fatigue right there's some hangover from that they're just like okay we won one now and they're just taking it easy and they don't look quite the same they don't look like the team that won the the championship and maybe you know losing bruce brown does kind of hurt them a little bit and that and that uh kind of sinks them down a little bit here in this very uh top heavy western conference here so i i think i'm i'm definitely leaning towards best case scenario the one caveat of course is I mean, obviously, we, we can do this with all the teams, but I think particularly for the Nuggets because they have guys like Mike Porter Jr. and Jamal Murray who have struggled with injuries is that's the worst case scenario is these guys are not healthy and it becomes the Jokic show all over again, which we've seen a couple of years ago. And we know the ceiling for that is probably a first round exit, maybe a, a, or, you know, a, a quick trip to the second round and you get bounced in four or five games. But I'm going to lean with best case scenario. I think that they just keep on rolling. I think the confidence that you get from being a championship contender or from being a a champion, I should say, is that you want to keep it rolling. They they say it's hard to defend a title, but I think that that confidence also adds to, you know, this mix that they got going on. They have the best player in the league who is incredibly durable, who is an MVP candidate every year, and even if MPJ and Jamal Murray miss a little bit of time during the season. I don't think it's going to harm their long-term prospects. So I'm I'm leaning with them probably being the one seed again, or at least being a top three seed. You know, maybe if they realize, all right, we can take our foot off the gas a little bit and chill because we know that that we can win this championship with this team. So which way are you leaning? Yeah, I'm I'm le- I'm with you. I'm leaning towards the best case scenario. I think you know. They just have that extra confidence, like, hey, we won one now. You know, we've always been contenders, but we finally got one. Uh, I think, right, obviously, like you said, bearing injuries, I think they'd probably finish at least top three, if not the top seed in the West. Yeah, I think 50, 50 wins is, is uh, a realistic easy. goal for them. Yeah, yeah, easy. Yeah, and probably, probably hovering around the same 53, 54 wins. <laughs> okay, the next team is the Phoenix Suns. So their projected win total or over under is 51.5, which is a pretty solid jump from last year's record of 45 and 37. This is an entirely new team from 2022. And if you look at the list of additions, it's a very long list. <laughs> Thanks to the trade that involved, where they're involved in the Damian Lillard trade, 
They, they get Bradley Beal. But their big additions are Bradley Beal, of course, Yusuf Nurkic, Grayson Allen, Nasir Little, Keon Johnson, and five other names that you don't have to mention. But this is essentially a rebuilt team from top to bottom. Key departures, of course, Chris Paul. They lose him in a trade. Deion Drayton has gone in a trade. Cameron Payne, I guess. Torrey Craig. And that's really about it. I guess Jock Landale, he was, he was big for them in the playoffs. So it cost him some depth there. But this is a completely rebuilt team that's very top-heavy with three of the best offensive players in the league. So what do you think is the best and worst-case scenario for the Suns this year? Yeah, I mean, best-case scenario here is they finish top of the West. They have Bradley Beal, Kevin Durant. Uh, they're just, they just look really primed, and they're, they're on the top of their game along with Devin Booker here. And they, they they just really gel well, and their depth is actually really really good. If uh, you know the free agent additions they sign, uh, they really help, and they don't miss DeAndre Jordan, they don't miss Jock Landell, they Nurkic plays pretty well, and they finish as the the one seed. I think that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, um, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant struggle to share the ball here. Obviously, injuries is always worst case, but uh, they struggle to share the ball. Offense doesn't look great. Depth pieces aren't great. And they, they kind of are in the same boat that they were in last year um, where, you know, they're, they're just an okay team and maybe that's not enough to get out of the West. And that's, I think that's their worst case scenario where they still mm -hmm. probably are a top five team in the West, but just not enough to get out of the, maybe the second round of the West. Yeah. I, I, for, of those two, I think I'm leaning towards definitely best case scenario. Uh, I'm looking at this roster and I see a lot of dudes you know, a lot of guys that, that can contribute. Obviously, they have the, the big three that can do whatever they want offensively. Defense is going to be a question mark um, come playoff time. But regular season, defense is an afterthought for the most part. So I think that the issues with them will be like rim protection. They don't have a lot of big man depth. It's basically KD is going to be playing the five, I guess, in the playoffs. But again, in the regular season, because I don't trust Yusuf Nurkic to be healthy this the, the whole season. He just has shown a track record of that. So, But the regular season, I can see them rolling. I can see them topping this 50 win, 50, 51 uh, you know, win total. I can see them getting close to 60 wins. I know that they're going to load manage with KD and some of these other guys. But Devin Booker is still pretty young. Bradley Beal is, is you know, 30, I believe, and he doesn't have a lot of miles on him because he doesn't have a lot of playoff games and, you know, deep playoff runs. So I, I'm seeing them, you know, if I had to choose, I think I would pick them as the one seed given all the talent that they have. What do you think? I agree with you there. I think they're too talented not to make this work. And I like the depth that they signed. Uh, obviously, the big man depth is a little concerning, but I think they're hoping... Uh, one Tabi is going to be like kind of that stretch big guy that could play for them and knock down shots. So, uh, but, but yeah, maybe they'll pick up someone along the way to shore that up. But I do think they're just way too talented not to make this work. And the guys they have coming off the bench is way better than what they had last year. So I think, yeah, I agree with you. It's going to be the best case scenario here. And they're probably going to finish as the one seed. Yeah. Some combination of like bowl, bowl, med to, I don't think Watanabe is a big, he's a, he's a, a point guard. He's like a stretch there. four. He's a four. He's a four. He's but he's a, he's a shooter, and he's, he's he was shooter, one of the yeah. best. I mean, he, I don't think he shot enough to qualify for like you know the best three point percentage in the league, but he was up there last year before things. Yeah, fell he's, apart he's more like a Gallinari Nets. type player where he could play the yeah. four. Yeah. Okay. For sure. For sure. Our next team here is our hometown Golden State Warriors. Their projected win total over under is forty eight point five which is a nice little jump from last year's 44 and 38 record. But last year was a bit of the season from hell for the Warriors. We had Chris, uh, Steph Curry miss a bunch of time. We had Andrew Wiggins miss a bunch of time for some personal issues. We had all kinds of weird chemistry issues. Thanks to Draymond Green punching Jordan Poole in the face, Anthony Lamb being on the team. Uh, thank God he's gone. I, I think he's in New Zealand now. <laughs> so New Zealand or Australia, but good riddance to him. So they've made some some pretty decent uh, additions. Uh, Chris Paul, of course, was the headliner. Uh, they brought back Draymond. They signed Corey Joseph. Dario Saric, I think, is going to be a huge player for this team. They drafted a bunch of guys that may or may not make an impact, but uh, Brandon Podzemski, I believe you believe, pronounce his name that way, 
looks to be a pretty good player already. And there's a bunch of, you know, free agent guys that are hanging on and we'll, we'll see what happens with them like Rudy Gay and, and uh, those guys. The key departures, of course, Jordan Poole, Dante DiVincenzo, Patrick Baldwin Jr. I guess he's a key departure. And Ty Jerome, who played a decent amount of minutes for them, you know, during that that stretch when Steph Curry was out. So what is the best and worst case scenario for the Warriors this year? Yeah, best case scenario, this the CP3 experiment does work out. It's uh it's exactly how they kind of envision it. He takes some pressure off Steph Curry, they 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 keep rolling and they can kind of play a new death lineup with CP3 in it. Uh, a little smaller than what they're used to, but I think that's the best case scenario. And they finish somewhere here in the top four, top three in the West, uh, and they and they do really well, right? It's it's everything works. The depth pieces are there, uh, and everything goes the way it should, right? Everything they envision. But worst case scenario, maybe CP three is is just a little old, and he's he's not quite the same CP three. Uh, it's not really working out. Um, the Warriors have chemistry issues again. It gets a little weird in season. Maybe Draymond punches CP3. I don't know, man. Can never tell with Draymond. Uh, and the Warriors are here struggling to just get at, uh, get out of the play-in games here. So that's I think that's their worst case scenario where uh, it just doesn't work out with the depth pieces in CP3, and they they kind of look old, right? That's that's kind of the concern with the Warriors. They are a little on the older side, so that's the worst case scenario. But we'll see. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I can I can see that. I, I know they are now one of the older teams in the NBA, I think the key piece that we're missing is I think that we're going to see a much larger role for Kaminga. We're going to see a much larger role for Moses Moody. And Absolutely. I think Dario is going to be a huge piece for this team. He's going to be some combination of Otto Porter and Bielitsa. I know he's had some injury issues uh, in the past couple of years with the ACL and some other stuff, but I loved him in Philadelphia. I think he's a great stretch big. I think he's going to give them, and the second unit especially, some much needed size because I think that that's, if I'm looking at this roster, that's definitely the primary weakness is a lack of mm-hmm. depth at, at big. Yep. And it's concerning. I'm glad we didn't sign Dwight Howard because I don't think uh, personality <laughs> wise he would have been a good fit. But I am worried. I'm like, maybe just go out and get one of these big guys off the waivers or you know, get some size somewhere. I'm sure one of these lower end teams are going to be getting rid of their third string center or something like that. Just, we just need kind of a, to use a baseball analogy, like an innings eater, just a guy, a relief pitcher, you know, just get in there, play 10, 15 minutes a game, you know, maybe 20 minutes a game when Draymond has the night off or whatever. So that, that's my main concern. But I think the main issues that we saw last year with the Warriors was of course the team chemistry, which you solved that problem by getting rid of Jordan Poole. And the other one was just a lack of, cohesion in the second unit and a lack of a true backup point guard to Steph Curry. I know it sounds crazy, but I thought the second unit looked better when Ty Jerome was running it versus Jordan Poole. And you need that guy that's going to be the mature floor general. I know Chris Paul is older, but I I do think in the regular season, he's going to be a massive, massive upgrade to Jordan Poole and just running that offense. And like you said, taking some pressure off Steph and we saw, a, we've gotten a taste of it in the preseason of them sharing the floor together. And Chris Paul, of course, for all the negative things that I have to say about him, you know, and his shenanigans, he's one of the smartest players ever. And I think that combined with the leap that I think we're going to see from Kaminga and Moody, I think this team is going to be easily in the top four in the West. What do you think? 100% agree. I think, you know, the Warriors really did addition by subtraction right getting rid of pool solves a lot of issues right he just he just wasn't a fit he and i never saw him as a fit he just had one really good year where he showed he could fit somewhat but pool's just never a fit i think you're going to see growth like you said from kaminga and moody you're going to get good bench pieces with you know sarich and Corey joseph and i think that even the rookies they got they're they're guys that are going to be good you know bench pieces and i and i think you know they'll probably find another guy who's going to be like anthony lamb who's going to just come in and just hustle up and down the court as a big guy. I think that's probably where they're leaning, probably looking for someone from the G League to do that. And uh, I, I agree with you. So they're going to finish top four, bearing injuries, obviously. But I think this Chris Paul experiment will work and will they'll reap the benefits of it. And uh, hopefully that translates into another title. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm not worried. I'm not worried at all 
about chemistry issues. I think if you're Chris Paul, you realize the point of the point of the your career that you're at, where you should be taking a step back. I I don't think he has the ego issues where he's like, I need to start, I need to play forty minutes, whatever it is. I think that was the other thing was the foolish approach of the two timelines thing they were trying to do, which sounded great on paper, but obviously once it came to you know down to it, I was like, all right, this is this is stupid. <laughs> this is not working. Now you have a very mature team. Everyone knows their role. There should be, you know, there's egos that you have to massage. And Steve Kerr, I think, is, is going to have his hands full. But I think it's going to be easier to tell, you know, 37-year-old Chris Paul, hey, man, like, just chill out a little bit. You're not going to play versus trying to talk down Jordan Poole and trying to get him back on the same page with Draymond and all that. So, yeah, I'm definitely leaning best case scenario as well. It should be a lot of fun to watch. Okay, our next team are the Los Angeles Lakers. Their over-under is 47.5, and last year's record was 43-39. and 39. But you can kind of throw that out the window because this is a completely new team. They were a completely new team by the trade deadline last year, and they rebuilt their roster yet again. Key additions, I mean, they brought back Anthony Davis, brought back Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell. Rui Hachimura, who was great in the playoffs. They signed Gabe Vincent, Christian Wood, Torian Prince, Jackson Hayes, Cam Reddish, and they drafted this kid, uh, Jalen Hood Shafino, I believe is how you pronounce it, who uh, Lakers fans are very excited about. Key departures, Dennis Schroeder, who was a big part of that team last year, and then a couple guys that uh, made some plays in the playoffs, and Lonnie Walker and Malik Beasley, but they were not huge parts of the regular season success. So what is the best and worst case scenario for this Lakers team? Yeah, best case scenario, they continue seeing growth from Austin Reeves. They All these depth pieces that they've signed are really good contributors. Then, you know, the Lakers are just rolling. And even though LeBron's probably going to miss like two, three weeks in the regular season just because he likes to take it off, uh, Anthony Davis is going to, you know, probably take some time off and the Lakers just keep rolling and they finish here in the top four. Uh, I think that's their best case scenario and they're, they're a strong contender. And, you know, they, they, you know, again, make it to the Western Conference Finals. I think that's their best case scenario because they have definitely the, the bench pieces to do that. And, you know, LeBron looks like he's beating father time here, right? And he's, he's still looking like LeBron of old and he's still putting up numbers and he's doing everything that he does. Uh, so I think that's their best case scenario. Worst case scenario, father time does catch up with LeBron and LeBron looks kind of old and they got too many guys and they can't play them all and people are unhappy and, you know, that's going to lead to issues. And, you know, I, I think uh, I think that's really their their issue. They have too many guys, maybe, um, and so that could I can see that boiling down to some issues and LeBron slowing down a little bit, and then it's on the shoulders of Anthony Davis to kind of carry this team, which he can. But I don't know if he can do that entirely in the regular season, and that maybe slows him down when they get to the playoffs and he's tired and th- these kind of things that you see, and then it's maybe like a first round, second round exit for them because mm-hmm. they they just they don't have the the legs to do it between LeBron and Anthony Davis. Yeah, I mean, Anthony Davis definitely carried them at the end of the season when LeBron was coming back from the the foot injury. So we know he can do it. He's done it before. It's just obviously the huge question mark about his health and all that. It's another team just like the Nuggets where it's fair to ask about the injury history. And LeBron, I mean, he's had a couple years now where he has had some injuries that have cost him some significant time. I believe it was the hip a couple years ago. The foot last year, supposedly he's feeling 100%. Now, the question, I guess, before I give my opinion is, do you think there's a path for them to be the one seed in the, in the West? And do they even care to be the one seed in the West? I think there is a path, um, but that requires Anthony Davis to play all 82 games. That requires LeBron to play like 70 games at least. And, and then it requires these guys to like just have monster games on, like on and off, right? Like Christian Woods is going to be... Have, have, have gonna have to have some monster games, you know. D'Angelo Russell is gonna have some monster games. Like they're gonna get, they're gonna need some con- contributions from Austin Reeves to have some monster games, right? Um, I think there is a path, right? There is a path. There's, I mean, if everyone healthy, I think the Lakers could contend for the one seed, but that's a big if, right? I th- mm-hmm. think given the injury histories of Davis and James. Yeah, and I don't think there's a reason for them to go for that one seed. I think this is a, a largely veteran team course with with LeBron leading the way and Anthony Davis so 
there's no reason for them to push as hard as they needed to, uh, you know, to get that one seed. I think they realized the value of home court to an extent, but not to the, uh, not at the detriment of their health and all that. So I don't see them pushing for that. Uh, I'm leaning, I'm kind of of two minds here. Um, I thing is, I do look at this team on paper and I'm just like, holy shit, like this is, they're stacked. <laughs> you know, they're, they're too deep at every position, at least, you know, for the most part, I mean, it's not, they're not too deep all-stars at every position, but they have some good uh, depth at big. I, you know, Christian Wood is not a, a plus defender, but he can score. You have Jackson Hayes who can't really score, but he's a pretty good defender. He's a good rim protector. So if Anthony Davis does miss some time or if they sit him for a bit, then they have some bigs that can, you know, absorb some of those minutes. Rui Hachimura is bigger than I thought he was. He, he's a, he's a big <laughs> and he can spread the floor. Austin Reeves, I don't like the guy. <laughs> he's overrated, but he's a good player, and they have scoring. They have uh, D'Angelo Russell. They, I think Gabe Vincent is a huge pickup for them. Again, I think eventually he could take that starting spot from D'Angelo Russell because I think he's a, a steadier player than Russell. Better defender. He works a little bit harder. So they're scary on paper. The only thing that has me kind of, like I said, of two minds is... The fact that it's year 21, year 22, whatever it is for LeBron, I don't know how long he can do this. And Anthony Davis, more often than not, he's not playing more than 60 games. And I think as he gets older, it's only going to get harder for him to do that. So I do see them both missing some significant time. And I do see them kind of in that mix, just like last year, where they're fighting to get out of the play-in at the end of the season. What do you think? I, I I agree with you there. I think, you know, LeBron, he's probably going to take the week off before All-Star break. He's going to take the week off after All-Star break. You know, you know he, LeBron's smart. He knows he can't go 82 games anymore, so he's going he's gonna to rest. Uh, Anthony Davis, like you said, he has a track record of playing maybe 60, 65 games in a season, so he's going to miss time. Um, so I agree with you. And I think also they're going to have some issues with playing time, right? Like D'Angelo Russell's going to get unhappy. Maybe Gabe Vincent gets unhappy. Uh, you know, Jackson Hayes gets unhappy, but you know, I think D'Angelo Russell is going to cause quite a scene down there if he doesn't get his playing time. And so I think, you know, you're going to have some chemistry issues as well with all these depth pieces mm-hmm. you added. That's if he's even on the team. I've, everything I've heard this season is he's... Uh, it sounds like they're, they're trying to trade him. But yeah, we'll exactly. He's just, he, they're just polishing him up, putting him, out, put him out in the shop window for someone to come, come get him. <laughs> so I, I'd be surprised if he's on the team come playoff time, but I, I do see them again you know, near the, the, not the bottom half of the standings, but the bottom half of the playoff standings and gearing up for the playoffs. Cause I wouldn't want to see them in the playoffs, but I think in the regular season, 100%, yeah. you know, they're just going to not quite cruise, but I think, yeah, they're going to pick their spots. I'll say that. Exactly. Exactly. Right there. I mean, they were like, Oh, we did this last year. We snuck in at the seventh seed and look where we went. We went to the Western conference finals. Why don't we just do it again this year? We, we got more pieces. So I think that's, that's their plan. All right, next team is the Los Angeles Clippers. Their projected win total or over under is 46.5. Their last year's record was 44 and 38. And their key additions is bringing back Russell Westbrook, who they signed at the end of the season last year. They trade for Kenyon Martin. They bring back Mason Plumley. They draft a couple guys. They sign Josh Primo, who's a really interesting prospect. And their big loss was Eric Gordon. So what is the best and worst case scenario for the Los Angeles Clippers? Yeah, best case scenario for the Los Angeles Clippers is that, you know, they have a fully healthy team. Westbrook is continues gelling like he was last year towards the end of last year with this team. Uh Kawhi is prime Kawhi again and they're, you know, they're in the top 5 mix here in the West. I think that's their their best case scenario that they're in the top 5. Worst case, you know, I don't know. I don't know about Kawhi Leonard. I don't know about Paul George, right? And they don't really have the depth pieces. Uh, they're, you know, I, they're they're relying on Russell Westbrook to carry them night in, night out. If those two guys aren't there, I think you know they probably find themselves in the playing playing games again, right? Right down there in the eight nine seed. And I think that's that's uh, that's their worst case scenario, like like it was kind of towards last year. But they just happened to get some luck and uh, push themselves up towards then. But they were definitely in that mix, and I think. That's their worst case scenario that they're really fighting to get into the play in games. Yeah. And um, they're also a, um, it's, there's a lot of rumors that they're going to trade for James Harden. 
which yeah. which I don't know why, <laughs> but hey. You know, I think it's just, uh, you know, Steve Ballmer wants to, he loves those stars. He's like mm-hmm. hoarding these stars. Like, you know, they're, they're just and stars that are still have John prime. Wall on the roster too? Is he still on the roster? No, they, they traded him, they I believe, at the okay. end of the year. He was on the okay. Rockets again. Um, so he's not there. But yeah, there's just a, th- these are like the 20, you call it like the 2017 All Stars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the the 20, like, yeah. You know, that's what he's trying to do is like get all the uh, all NBA guys from five years ago. I'm surprised he's not going after Dwight Howard just to complete the set. But <laughs> yeah, I just um, I think the Josh Primo signing is is intriguing. The fact that they're taking a chance on that guy. Um, but, you know, you can never fault Russell Westbrook's effort. And I think he's going to be a, a difference maker because he's durable. He never misses time. He, he plays a lot. He plays hard. He's also getting older. I don't know how long he can maintain that same level of um, effort and energy. So the way I'm, I'm, I'm leaning that they're going to miss the playoffs entirely. I think they will be, I mean, it's hard to put them outside of the top 10 considering the talent that they have, but I'm just, I'm leaning like a nine, 10 seed. I, I, I don't think they're good enough. I think there's a lot of younger teams, a lot of healthier teams that don't have to rely on betting on, you know, is Kawhi going to play today? Is he going to play this week? Is he going to play next week? And then they have all these load management rules now where they're trying to, to you know, dissuade teams from from sitting guys and stuff like that. So I, I can see them, maybe if they trade for James Harden, then I think they're going to be, you know, the six, seven seed because he's a regular season, you know, machine. He just keeps things going. He's still relatively durable. He's he's good enough for the, for the regular season. But I, I see them... Unless they make that trade, I think they're going to struggle to make the uh, to make the play in. Yeah, I slightly disagree. I I think they'll be right there around the eight seed. But like you said, right, you're you're predicting them tenth, eleventh. But I I think they'll be there in the eight seed just on talent alone, right? They'll get enough games out of Paul George and Kawhi to kind of get them there to the eight seed. But like you said, having to rely on Kawhi Leonard and his health and his load management issues, like that's scary, right? And Paul George, sim- similar, he's. He's been pretty unhealthy the last couple of seasons, so that is scary for them, and I don't think they have enough depth pieces behind those guys to to even make a run in the playoffs, so I, I agree mm. with you. I, like Even if they do get in, they're out in the first round for sure. Yeah, and they're going to be sacrificing some of that depth as well if they're going to try to get James Harden to make the salaries mm-hmm. match and all that. So, yep. uh, yeah, I'm pretty low <laughs> on the Clippers. As you can tell, this is, what, year five or years, maybe year five of the Kawhi and, and Paul George year experiment? Four. Year four. Something like whatever that. it is, it's it's yeah. not working out for them. It's not we'll working. say that. The next team is really intriguing, and it is the uh, Memphis Grizzlies. Their uh, over under is forty five point five. A uh, nice little drop from last year's record of fifty one and thirty one. Their key additions was they brought back Desmond Bain, or they gave him a contract extension. They get Marcus Smart from the Celtics. They signed Derrick Rose. They get Josh Christopher and Isaiah Todd. Their key departures are Tyus Jones, who was traded to the Wizards, Dylan Brooks, who was signed and trade to the signed and traded to the Rockets. And it's important to note that John Morant is going to miss, I believe, 20 games uh, through suspension. So that's a big departure for the first quarter of the season. So what are the best and worst case scenarios for the Grizzlies here? Best case scenario, I think, you know, the Grizzlies don't miss a beat with uh, John Morant missing those 20 games. They Derek Rose kind of comes in, fills in those shoes a little bit. Marcus Smart steps up. And, and they really they really just uh, show that they're a pretty solid team all around. Um, I think Marcus Smart was a great trade for them. They, they add another tough-nosed defender with Desmond Bain and those Jaron Jackson. So they add a lot of defense there. What I do think their worst-case scenario is is that they kind of miss John Moran and his offense. And even when John Moran comes back, they don't have enough offense. And they find themselves in a little bit of trouble, right? They can't score. These these games are, the games in regular season move pretty fast. You know, you got to have some three-point shooting. They don't have a lot of that. And I think, you know, the Grizzlies find themselves here in the bottom half of the West uh, versus their best case scenario where they're in the top five. So I think they probably find themselves somewhere between the six and eight seed is their worst case scenario. Uh, and you know mm-hmm. John Moran misses those twenty games. He maybe he continues having some of those issues that he displayed last year, and they continue on this year. And so that that's a you know it's a it's the Grizzlies are one of those true two t- teams that you're just like what the hell's going to happen with these guys? We don't know. Um, but I do like the Marcus Smart pickup for them. 
my other concern, I, I didn't even, I forgot to mention it, was I believe Jaron Jackson has a stress, fra- stress fracture in his right foot. I'm not sure when he's coming mm-hmm. back, but I think, I mean, the past couple of years, we've seen them be able to keep things rolling in the regular season with, with Ja out, whether it's through injury or suspension. I mean, last year suspended as well. I think the concern now is if him and Jaron Jackson are going to be out, I don't know if Marcus Smart is enough of an addition to pick up the, the offensive and defensive load that both of those guys uh, are leaving behind. I do think, of course, I mean, Jaron Jackson won Defensive Player of the Year last year. I, you know, a lot of people took issue with that. But, you know, the concern is they don't have enough talent to pick keep things going, at least in the beginning of the season. And then when they come back, is it going to be too late to basically make up the, the the losses in the standing? So I do see them as that fringe playoff play-in team somewhere again in that that eight to ten range. I do see them like along with the Clippers trying to you know make things happen at the end of the season to try to get into the playoffs. What do you think? I I agree with that. Um, I think that like you said, right? I think they're not. Gonna, they're going to miss John Morant in the beginning, and then they're just, it's just going to be it's going to take him some time to get back into shape, all that stuff, and then they'll they'll be kind of there in the six, seven, eight range, where they're just trying to fight in to get in. So I think we're we're both in agreement. This is a play in team for sure. Exactly. Yeah, or just slightly above the play in, maybe. Yeah, play in for sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Next team is the Minnesota Timberwolves. Their over under is forty four and a half, just a tad over last year's record of forty two and forty. Their big moves this year were basically bringing guys back, um, giving Anthony Edwards a contract extension, Nas Reed and a contract extension. They brought in Shake Milton, Troy Brown Jr., Luke Garza, a couple other guys to to fill out the back end of the roster. Uh, they lost out on Torian Prince. I believe they waived him, and he's now with the Lakers. So not a huge departure. A lot of the same pieces coming back from last year. The main thing, I think, with this team is that Carl Anthony Towns missed a ton of time last year, and obviously he's one of the best offensive big men in the NBA, and they were still able to finish you know, over 500 and, and get into the, the play-in, t- uh, play-in game um, and, of course, into the playoffs uh, where they got swept, I believe, or... No, they they went five actually against the Denver yeah. Nuggets, so not not bad. So, what is the best and worst case scenario for the Minnesota Timberwolves this year? I see the best case scenario here that Anthony Edwards takes another leap and he just like stratospheres into superstardom, and he really just puts this Timberwolves team on his back, and they kind of get close to somewhere in that five six range where they're you know not quite at the top of the West, but right in the middle there of the West. I think that's their best case scenario because Anthony Edwards is a baller and he could put this team on his back and even with Carl Anthony Towns missing some time they they could you know finish here uh, right above the play in spots worst case scenario uh I re- really didn't like the Rudy Gobert trade and it really continues to backfire on them Rudy Gobert regresses Carl Anthony Towns doesn't look that great next to next to him and Anthony Edwards was just you know I think he maybe takes a step back right that's their worst case scenario where they got really high level production out of him but he for some reason regresses which is uh and then they're just out of the play in games. They like they bear, they don't even they don't even sniff the play ins, right? They're mm-hmm. they're just they're just the Minnesota Timberwolves, right? They've just been kinda like that since <laughs> since KG left. So that's that's their worst case scenario. Yeah. I am maybe I'm in the minority here, but I am a big believer in this team this season. In the regular season. <laughs> Let me add that that caveat, right? So there's there's always a lot of talk about, you know, guys coming back from FIBA or the World Cup, or the Olympics, whatever, and they have this like newfound confidence. And I think we got to see that this um, this summer with Anthony Edwards. It was obviously not the best USA team. I don't even I don't know if they medaled this year. Maybe they got the bronze. Maybe not in the World Cup. Anyway, he was the alpha, and I think we're gonna see a big leap from him because I think his mentality is going to be finding like this is my team. I'm going to take this over. He's, he's young enough. He's about to hit his prime. Uh, I think I'm kind of leaning towards him for being MVP this year. I, I have really high hopes for him. I think just, again, just because of his age and the fact that he's not going to be load managing. I think some of these other guys, they've had playoff success. They've had, t- they have titles, Giannis, um, 
Jokic, Tatum, all these guys, they've tasted playoff success, and that is their goal. I think the T-Wolves, especially Anthony Edwards, I think he wants to prove that he can be you know, one of the best five players in the league, and I think he's going to be gunning for that MVP. And for the reason that uh, you know, I think this team makes a lot of sense in the regular season. You look at their starting five. I mean, I know you don't, you're not a fan of Rudy Gobert, but I do think, again, in the regular season, he is an incredible difference maker defensively. And they missed a t- Carl Anthony Towns missed a ton of time last year, and they still won 42 games. So I think if he's be able to stay healthy for all the things that we can talk about him as a, as a defensive negative and not being able to handle his, himself in, in situations in the playoffs, he's an excellent regular season player. And I think this team is deep enough to, to make, um, you know, to, to withstand some injuries, withstand some of these other things. But I think they're also young enough at those, these key positions with uh, Edwards and Nas Reed to be a top four seed this year. I, I need to like sit back and think who my, you know, put my order together. But I do think that they will have home court in the first round of the playoffs. What do you think? Wow. I I don't agree with that. I do not agree with that. I think I do agree with your Anthony Edwards assessment that he's he's just going to come out scorching the league. Um, he's he's going to really put this team on his back. But I don't feel like they have enough pieces to make that top four push. But I, I will say I could see them conceivably finishing like the sixth seed. But I don't think they get home court advantage here in the first round. I, I, I will disagree with that because I, I love Anthony Edwards. I think you're right about him. He's going to He's going to come out flaming here, but I don't, I don't like the rest of the team. I mean, I like what Carol Anthony a- Towns, but, mm-hmm. but I, I just, I don't know. It's just like, you know, you're going to have to rely on Anthony Edwards a lot. And then teams are going to start focusing on Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns is going to have to step up. Sure. He could do that. But after that, who's scoring for them? Who's, who's, who's doing, who's doing the scory for, scoring for Nas Reed. Who's, who's, Nas Reed, right? Like <laughs> is Nas Reed, the third guy you want behind those two. And not Jaden McDaniels. Ed, Carl, I thought you McDaniels, know Jaden McDaniels, right, yeah, good Jayden player. McDan- like these are not the guys that I'm hoping for are contributing as like one of my top five guys in a playoff team. And Gobert is not going to con- contribute offensively. Yes, defensively, great, great player. Um, but if you if you got a one man show, it's it's kind of hard to succeed. But you know Miami kind of proved us wrong last year with mm-hmm. Jimmy Butler being a one man show. So yeah, I, I think the the main issue with with this team and the main kind of negative opinion driver, whatever you want to call it, is just their, their playoffs. And um, we're not talking about the playoffs, or I'm not talking about the playoffs, at least. I'm not picking them to make the conference finals or win a ring or something. I just think that in the regular season, they are built for success. And you, talk, you said Rudy Gobert is not going to contribute offensively. I think he can in the regular season because he's not going to get played off the floor. I think he's a lob threat, I, I, all that stuff. And I think, again, in those 82 games, I, I do think they are good enough. They have enough offensive talent. They have enough depth to be in that four seed. And I think I, I see them kind of having a, like a similar run to the Kings last year, where it's a younger team. There's a they they stay healthy. They have a great player. I, I think Anthony Edwards is going to step into like that De'Aaron Fox role, where he's going to be the main driver of this team's success. He's going to hit all the clutch shots, do all that stuff, and just basically take this team again, to a top four seed. I know the Kings were a three seed last year. We can talk about them later, but, or we're going to talk about them later. But I, that's just how, how I'm feeling. I'm thinking top four seed for sure. All right. We will see here, Father. <laughs> we will see, man. Right. I see you shaking your head. It's all good. We got to differ sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Our next team is the New Orleans Pelicans. Their uh, over-under is 44 and a half, so tied with the Timberwolves. Their last year's record was 42 and 40, and their key additions was drafting um, Jordan Hawkins, 14th overall. They brought back Herbert Jones. They signed Cody Zeller, and their key losses was Jackson Hayes, who went to the Lakers, Josh Richardson, who went to the Heat, and Garrett Temple, who was waived. So what is the best and worst case scenario for the New Orleans Pelicans? The best case scenario here is Zion actually plays more than like 30 games in the regular season, right? <laughs> and uh, he's he's kind of back to being Zion, the guy everyone thought he was going to be. He plays really well. He stays in shape. He's, he's not getting hurt. Pelicans finish maybe here in the top seven. Uh, just right there in the, like right at the play in contention spot, I feel that's their best case scenario. I mean, they are talented with CJ McCollum, Brandon Ingram, Zion, but Again, the main driver of that is Zion, right? And if Zion's not there, you are a slightly worse team. 
they have the talent, they have some depth, but I think that's their best case scenario is they're they're hovering there in the play in games. Worst case scenario, Zion is Zion, what he's been for the past two, three years. He just can't play more than like 25, 30 games. Brendan Ingram is has to carry the team again and and CJ McCollum is just old now, right? And so I think that that probably you know puts you down there in the in the lottery. You're you're looking at a lottery team uh, if that happens again, and maybe now it's time to trade Zion and see what you can get for him. I am one hundred percent out on this team. Yeah, hundred okay, thousand <laughs> percent out on this team. It it's kind of like the Clippers, but at least the Clippers have Westbrook, who's always healthy. But I just I look at this roster. I look at. There's too many questions. There's too many. Well, if Zion is healthy, we've been saying that for, I don't know, four years now. And we've seen what the Brandon Ingram show looks like. I think he's a good player. I think he can, you know, he's a box score stuffer, does a lot offensively, but he's also not that healthy either. I mean, last year he played 45 games, year before 55, year before that, 60 games. So he has his own injury concerns. And I think once this becomes the, CJ McCollum show, I think that that's the main issue. Um, and it's just, they're just not going to be good enough to compete in a very loaded West. Um, I'm just sure you can tell me if Zion is healthy. I do see a world where Zion plays, I don't know, 70, 75 games and they're, uh, you know, top eight seed or whatever. But I just, that, that's like an alternate universe to me. I, I will not believe it until I see it. So you maybe I'm super wrong on this team and they end up in the conference finals, but for now, I'm just I'm out. I, I think they're going to be in the bottom, you know, bottom three in the Western Conference because of of all that stuff. And you know, there's a lot of positives, but I think it's just there's too much, too much baggage with this team with Zion and all that. I know he's not happy there. I think he wants to leave, and there's just too much going on there. What do you think? I agree with you. I think you, you're going to see them as big sellers at the trade deadline. Maybe Brandon Ingram's on the move, CJ's on the move, Zion's on the move. Uh, so I think. I'm I'm with you. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Zion Zion just can't keep his hands off the Big Macs and other things. But we that guy. I don't know what he's what he's been doing in the NBA since he came in. So he's he has the potential. He has we the know talent. Exactly what he's been doing. It's yeah, we know good. what he's been doing. So it's it's not it's not been basketball related for sure. So yeah, I'm with you. I I think they're gonna blow it up uh, come the trade deadline, and you know someone's gonna go in on Brendan Ingram, and and one of these teams we talked about is probably gonna make a push there, or maybe one team in the East. So yeah. He's just Zion has just shown a stunning lack of maturity Absolutely. in his yep. his NBA career. You know, I get it. It's it's hard to stay in shape, uh, but the other stuff. I mean, it's just all the off court nonsense that that have, has come out. Again, I'm just 100 percent out on him. I'm 100 percent out on this team, and I think they'll be picking in the lottery next year. And I think Zion is is wearing another jersey in 2025. Absolutely. Yeah, or 2024, whatever it is. <laughs> I agree with you, 100%. All right, next is one of the more intriguing teams in the West, and that is the Oklahoma City Thunder. Their over-under is 44 and a half, uh, a little bit of a jump from last year's record of 40 and 42, where I believe they were the 10 seed, and they were a play-in team. Big additions, they, had, uh, they drafted Kaysan Wallace, who a lot of people are really happy about. They got they traded for Davis Bertans, and they made a couple other moves. They actually just did a trade today uh, to get Kevin Porter Jr., who is you know probably going to jail. <laughs> so they're going to they sign said they're going to wave him. They're going to wave yeah, him yeah. immediately. Yeah, of course. Just it's just definitely a you know salary move. But um, yeah, they, they they lose Victor Oladipo and some other guys who probably were not going to play for them anyway. This is a really loaded roster, a really deep roster. It's almost too deep because of all the picks they've had, um, and their main losses, Jared Butler. Eh, okay. And Dario Saric, who I think has gonna is gonna have a huge role on the Warriors, but didn't really have a role on this team. And I guess the biggest addition is Chet Holmgren, who, you know, obviously missed all of his rookie season, quote unquote rookie season with a foot injury, and now he's gonna be again a quote unquote rookie um in his second year with the team. So what is the best and worst case scenario for the Thunder? I think the best case scenario here is that the Thunder get, you know, a really good prospect there with Chet Hol- Holmgren and then they you know, Josh Giddy makes the leap, and jo- I mean, he he kind of showed flashes of making the leap last year, and he's kind of developing into this very deadly player. And then, you know, obviously they got Shea Gilgis Alexander, who's already took the leap last year, 
And, you know, this Thunder team starts rolling and they, they look kind of unstoppable. And Jalen Williams is coming out of there like last year, too. He was looking good. Um, so I think they have the pieces, they have the talent, and they got the depth there. So I think best case scenario here, they could finish top five in the West. Um, worst case scenario, everything goes wrong for them. <laughs> All these guys regress. Uh, you know, Josh Giddy doesn't look as good. Chet Holmgren, he doesn't look great. He, he actually looked bad. Uh, he, you know, obviously had health issues last year where he had a season-ending injury, uh, and that maybe catches up to him again this year. So things like that, right? Where and Shea Gilders Alexander is okay. He balled out last year, but now it seems like oh, now we know this guy, and so he takes us. He regresses last again, mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is the Thunder team is like it's like that. Where best case, yeah, it could be top five, but worst case, they could also be bottom five. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's it's just really hard to say. They have the talent, they have the pieces. Uh, if if things go well, I think you know I think we are going to see leaps from Josh Giddy and Jalen Williams, and you also see Chet Holmgren be really good. So if things go which well, Jalen Williams, top, both of them, both of them, both of them, both of them. I don't even know what I'm talking about. The one from Stanford. Yeah, yeah no, I'm just yeah, kidding. Yeah, yeah. But they got uh, too many Williams on the teams. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they go. What was it? Uh, I think it was uh, the Warriors announcer Bob Fitzpatrick. He would always say Jalen Williams from Arkansas. Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. It's really annoying. <laughs> I I'm I'm high on this team. I think the main reason that I'm I'm really high on this team is because of their youth. Uh, I think it's it's a very similar again to the Kings last year. I know I made the comparison with the T Wolves and the Kings, but I think the Thunder may be the more apt comparison because of how young everyone on this team is. And I think the fact that because of how young everyone is, they can push for a, a top four, top five seed. And I do think that is realistic. Um, you know, SGA, a lot of people were not super pleased with him being a first team all NBA guy. They thought that team success should determine some of that. But at at the very least, he's one of the 15 best players in the NBA. And you, you can say that with, with some degree of, of, of certainty. So um, I'm leaning on the positive side with this team because of the youth. Their, their big issue last year was they had no big man depth. They had no bigs whatsoever. I think Chet Holmgren answers some of those questions. Um, obviously, like we said, we had, he has a foot issue. He's not going to be able to, to, to bang with, with Jokic or Anthony Davis in the post. But I do think from what we've seen from him, in the regular season, or sorry, in the preseason, he can provide some of that rim protection that they were missing really desperately. So uh, I, I do think that this team is going to be in, in the top five in the West. What do you think? I 100% agree. I like, I like their depth. I like the pieces. Uh, I like the talent. So I think they are going to be top five here. Yeah. The, the youth, the youth for me is, is the big piece. Is, is it's going to, you know, again, this is not about the regular season or it's not about the playoffs and them winning a title. It's just about the, the regular season and they have the horses to compete for that. Okay. Next up, the Sacramento Kings who were probably the best underdog or Cinderella story for last year. And they are another team again, tied with the Thunder and the Pelicans who, and the T-Wolves actually. Um, and their win total, their projected win total is 44 and a half. And last year they were 48 and 34. And somehow that was good enough for a three seed. Don't ask me how. Their big uh, additions, basically Chris Duarte, they traded him for the Pacers. They brought back DeMontis Sabonis. Uh, they brought back JaVale McGee, who gives them some uh, big man depth. Alex Len, they brought him back. And they have a really intriguing addition, the guy from Europe, Sasha Vezenkov, who I believe was the MVP of the EuroLeague last year. And if he's great, then it should be a major, major addition to this team. They didn't really lose anybody of any consequence. Uh, PJ Dozier, uh, Chimizy Metu, and Rashawn Holmes. So nothing crazy uh, on the way out. So what is the best and worst, best and worst case scenario for this Kings team? I think best case scenario, the Kings kind of keep rolling like they did last year. They, they finish here again somewhere in the top five, uh, depending on how the West shakes out. Uh, it's a really good regular season team. We saw big leaps from Fox, uh, so I think he keeps building on that, and him and Sabonis have great chemistry. Worst case scenario, maybe there's a slight regression here. Maybe they, they don't have enough depth pieces because of how good all the other teams in the West got, right? Um, and so they kind of fall down here into the 7-8 round where they're in the play-in games. And I think that's their worst case scenario, where they're just at the bottom of the playoff run versus at the, in the top of the playoff run. I'm leaning the negative, unfortunately. 
worst case scenario. Um, I do think they have enough talent to compete in the West. I just think that last year was a bit of an aberration in in terms of everything, right? I mean, everybody's talking about how healthy this team was. I don't think Rashawn, um, De'Aaron Fox missed any significant time last year. Uh, Domas Sabonis, I know he had a broken thumb or torn ligament, something like that in, in his thumb, but he did not miss any time. He chose not to have surgery. And there was just a lot of things that went in their favor. I think one thing people overlook and people may have talked about is that the fact that they are they, they were 48 and 34 last year. And I think in most seasons, so for example, the year before, if you won 48 games in the West, that was good enough for the sixth seed. So 48 wins is not, it's not like they were world beaters. They didn't hit 50 wins, 55, 16 wins, whatever. They were a slightly above average team, which is not a slight to them. It's just the reality. 48 wins is not usually a guarantee of a top three, top four, top five seed even. So I, I do think the regression that's going to happen is more so in the health department. I just don't think it's normal for basically none of your starters to miss any time <laughs> whatsoever. Um, they definitely benefited from a weird Western conference where all the contenders had major issues. The Grizzlies had suspensions. Jokic and the Nuggets were basically the only ones that didn't have something crazy happen to them where they basically blew up their team or restarted things like go up and down the West. And there's just a bunch of issues that happen with every single team that allowed the Kings to take advantage and finish, you know, in, the, in that three seed. And it showed because they were bounced in seven games by the Warriors in the first round. So they were a three seed, not a classic three seed that, you know, is one of the best teams in the NBA. I think they were just slightly above average, which again is no slight to them, but I do think, I do think they're a play-in team. I do see them scrapping for one of those play-in spots. I think, again, because of the youth that they have in their favor and some of the continuity that they have, but I don't see them sniffing anywhere near the top five or six seeds in the in the conference. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. I think the West got so much better, and these teams are not going to have those issues that they had last year. A lot of them will not. Um, I think the Kings just didn't do enough to get better, and so I think they're going to find themselves here at the bottom of the play-in games. All right, next up is the Utah Jazz. Or I'm sorry, the Dallas Mavericks. See, the Dallas Mavericks, their projected win total is 43.5. Last year, they were 38 and 44, even though a few of those last games, there were some shenanigans where they threw the games to get out of the play-in tournament because they wanted to keep their pick and they didn't bother you know, wanting to compete in the playoffs. Um, a couple big additions. They brought back Kyrie. They signed Grant Williams. Uh, they signed Seth Curry. They brought back... Uh, Dwight Powell, and they signed Dante Exum, who has been out of the league for a little bit, but it might be a big deal. Their big departures, Christian Wood, eh, Reggie Bullock, eh, Dav uh, Davis Bertans, eh, JaVale McGee, eh, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> no real key pieces here. So what is the best and worst case scenario for the Mavericks here? Best case scenario, I think, you know, the Kyrie Luka experiment showed that it could work and it does work and they stay healthy Luca, you know always in the MVP conversation maybe this is the year he takes the MVP and he really puts this Mavericks team on his back they get good contributions from their rookies they get good contribution from like Grant Williams Steph Curry maybe Dante Exum you know shows up as a player and they're they find themselves here I think as a six seed that's I think that's their that's their ceiling right there is the six seed um worst case scenario this Kyrie experiment doesn't work. Kyrie shows himself to what he's been showing himself the last few years. He's a nutcase. He doesn't he doesn't gel with his teammates. He he just, you know, does his Kyrie thing and they find themselves out of the the play in and they're probably looking at a, you know, twelve seed, something like that, where where they're just not they're just not in the play in. Yeah, I'm leaning worst case. I think they're back kind of where they were last year. I think offensively, they should be one of the more fun teams in the NBA. I, I Again, I don't love watching Luka, but I do think him and Kyrie, you throw Seth Curry in there, who, you know, knock down shooters, uh, floor space or all that. I don't think they can stop a nosebleed. They can't stop anyone defensively. And I think that's going to be their downfall. There's going to just be a ton of, you know, 120, 125 type games um, in their future. And I just don't see them, you know, finishing, I'd say again, like 10th, 11th. And they may just sit back and probably do the same thing where it's like, oh, we don't really want to be in the play in. Let's <laughs> let's take a chance in the lottery. Let's see if we can finally get a big that's going to compliment 
Luka Doncic. So yeah, I'm I'm thinking that there they'll be um you know bottom half maybe out of the plan. What do you think? I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't I don't think they're gonna contend here at all. Yeah, no, no surprise here. <laughs> all right. Okay, we're we're getting close to the end here. So next are the Utah Jazz. Their over under is thirty five point five. Last year they went thirty seven and forty five, and they were one of the early surprises in the NBA until they realized that you know we don't want to be good. We want to suck <laughs> this year. Uh, their main addition was uh, John Collins, and they drafted a couple guys in the top sixteen. Their big departures, Rudy Gay. That's really about it. So, what do you think is the best and worst case scenario for the Jazz here? I mean, best case scenario, they're somehow in the play-in games here, I think. They didn't really do a lot. John Collins mm, doesn't really move the needle for them. Uh, they showed some potential last year, sure, but then they kind of slowed down. I think kind of kind of similar, right? I think they'll be there in the 9-10th conversation. That's their best case scenario. Worst case scenario, they're you know fighting for a top three pick, uh, which probably they want to do, I, I would imagine. That's what they want. Um, so that's that's my best case, worst case for the Jazz. Oh yeah, I think we're both in agreement. Leaning worst case, I think they just they they don't have the incentive right now to compete. They'll be fun. I think Laurie Markkinen was one of the revelations last year, mm-hmm. but I don't. I think aside from him, you know, I guess Walker Kessler, but nothing else on that team really excites me. Um, so I think we're both leaning worst case scenario here, right? Yep, hundred percent. All right. Next up, the Houston Rockets. So their projected uh, over-under is 31.5. Last year, they were an awful 22-60. and 60. They made a ton of changes to this team. Drafted Amon Thompson, signed Fred Van Vliet, signed Dylan Brooks, drafted Cam Whitmore, signed Jeff Green, Jock Landale, brought back friend of the podcast, Trevor Hudgens. Their big <laughs> departures, Kevin Porter Jr. because he is human trash, uh, Kenyon Martin Jr., is gone. He got traded. Josh Christopher, Frank Kaminsky, a couple other guys. So nothing too crazy. Big addition, I guess, is, is a new head coach, uh, Ime Udoka, who I thought was never going to coach again in the NBA. But he made a surprise return to the Rockets after leaving the Celtics in bizarre uh, and controversial fashion. So what's the best and worst case scenario for the Rockets here? Best case, Rockets are they're in the play-in, right? They're 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 in the tenth, eleventh seed. There they. You know, Van Vliet looks pretty good. Dylan Brooks actually is a fit for them. Eamon Thompson is like maybe the second or third best rookie in this draft. Uh, so I think I think that's their best case scenario. They show potential. They flash and they, they get there towards the play-in. Worst case, they're the Rockets. They tank again. Nothing really works out. Maybe they overpaid for Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks. Those guys look pretty bad together. And they're, they're sitting there again at the top three, top four pick. Yeah, um, I think they'll be better than last year. They'll be more competitive because Udoka is is a good coach, despite mm-hmm. all the other stuff. I just think there's too many mouths to feed. There's too many young guys who want to prove that they're worthy of a second contract. I think it's just going to be a weird team. Uh, this is just going to be year one of the the Udoka rebuild. So I, I do see them, you know, finishing you know maybe thirty wins, something like that. They'll be fun to watch. I like Van Vliet as a player, but yeah, I'm, I'm thinking thirty wins or so. Yeah, hey, next. I agree with you. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> uh, next are the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, their over-under is 29.5. Uh, they went 22-60 and 60 last year, and of course they were awarded with the number one overall pick. Their key additions, Victor Wembenyama, Trey Jones, they brought, brought him back, and Shetty Osman from the Cavaliers, who I really like as a player. And they didn't really lose anybody uh, of note. So what is the best and worst case scenario for the Spurs here? I think best case, you know, Wemby is that generational prospect that everyone thinks he is. He kind of, you know, catapults them there to the, like the bottom bottom half of the playoff run here, like eight seed, nine seed, um, and they, they the Spurs are firing with all their young talent. They show potential. Popovich has another potential dynasty on his hands before he retires, and they they kind of flash that potential. Worst case, Wemby can't hold up to the grit and grind of the NBA. He you know, takes them a little time to figure things out, and they're somewhere there in the twelfth, thirteenth range uh, in the West. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm. I think this is one of those teams where, I mean, the worst case scenario is obviously that that when Miyama gets hurt or something and and is not able to hold up to the physicality. I think even if he struggles this year, I, I wouldn't be like completely out on him as a player. So I think their worst case scenario is to be 
you know, competitive enough and not make the, you know, maybe be in the play-in mix. I think their best case scenario is to be in the lottery and continue <laughs> to not tank in the same way. I mean, I know uh, Popovich says they don't tank. They definitely tanked at the end of last year. They, oh, you know, there was some they wink, wink. Yeah. Last, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Take. I just, we I don't take. think they have we enough take. talent to make some noise. There has to be some, something crazy has to happen for them to be, I think in the play-in or playoff mix. So I think their best case scenario is, Let's just, you know, play Wemby, I don't know, 60 games or something just to not, uh, you know, put too much wear on him in the beginning of his career, especially as he bulks up and gets on NBA nutrition program and all that stuff. I know he does a ton of stuff off the court to, for his body, but I think they want him to to grow into his body. And I think they're going to take their sweet time with him. They're one of the best, you know, organizations in the NBA for that. So I think best case scenario is where I'm leaning. And again, that's being competitive, but still being a lottery team to add some more talent to this court. What do you think? Yeah, I can I can see that they they definitely should add more talent, right? They should get gear up for another dynasty with Wemby as the centerpiece. Yeah, who knows? Maybe they'll get the number one pick again next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, and last but not least, the Portland Trailblazers. Their over under is twenty eight point five, and last year they went a surprising thirty three and forty nine. Their big additions: Scoot Henderson, who they drafted number three overall; DeAndre Ayton, Robert Williams, Malcolm Brogdon. They brought back Jeremy Grant, brought back uh, Matisse Theibel, and they drafted Keegan Murray's brother, 23rd overall, Chris Murray. Their big departure, Damian Lillard, who leaves the team after, you know, about a decade in Portland. And a couple other guys, you know, nobody of of any other consequence, I guess Yusuf Nurkic, but, you know, he just wasn't healthy enough to make much of a difference for them anyway. So what is the best and worst case scenario for this team? Uh, I mean, I feel like their best and worst case is kind of the same. They uh, <laughs> yeah, they finish here in the bottom half of the West, right? They or they just finish at the bottom of the West, right? They don't they don't make too much noise, but they stay a little bit competitive. Get good some, you know, good playing time. Get their young guys some good playing time. He gels with DeAndre Ayton, and they come back next year with the top three pick and. Watch out! The West, uh, West might be on alert for Scoot Henderson and the and the Blazers after that, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's their best and worst case, right? Because they want to get that top three pick, add talent, you know, grow this young team. They got a young core in place and keep growing it. Uh, I honestly don't think they'll be competitive at all after that Damian Lillard trade, and it's just all about kind of developing their young guys. I think they'll be the best case scenario, which I'm I'm leaning is they're competitive in the sense that. They're going to lose a ton of games, but they're going to be in a lot of games. But I think when it's going to come down to it, they don't have the defensive personnel to get stops. And I think a lot of these guys that they added, I don't think Robert Williams is on the team for long. I don't think Malcolm Brogdon is on the team for long. Both those guys are probably going to get moved. And they're just going to be kind of a shell of themselves by the end of the season, which is exactly what they want. I think they want, they're going to hand the keys to Scoot Henderson and they're going to say, it's your show, you and Anthony Simons and Shaden Sharp. And even DeAndre Ayton, they're going to say, all right, this is your team now. Go do you know whatever you want to do. Put up numbers and things like that. I think they don't want to build bad habits and all that, but I don't think they're going to be too concerned about winning uh, this year with this new core. So I think, yeah, they're going to be probably the worst team in the West, maybe like bottom three, like you said, but they are going to be competitive. I think they're going to be a lot of fun to watch just because they have a lot of guys that are exciting and they can score. And I'm definitely curious to see what, what Scoot Henderson does. I think we're in agreement here. 100%. Yeah. So that's it for the best and worst case scenarios. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot and ask you the top eight because I think we've waffled a little bit. Maybe we need to think <laughs> we about did. this. Yeah, we, do. Maybe we should have talked about it before the recording so we could have had a top eight. But I think you guys get an, an idea of where we're leaning. But thank you guys for listening. It's going to be an incredible uh, season in the West. It's going to be very competitive. Make sure to check us out on YouTube. Make sure to f- uh, subscribe, leave us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And check us out on all the major social media channels at 4040 Vision Pod. Thanks, Oman. Appreciate you, man. Peace.